that we may ask the Lord for blessing in prayer. Our God and Father, we give thanks that we were able this morning to remember the Lord Jesus, the one who get you gave to the world for the world to be saved by him. We give thanks for his coming into this world to live among men, to suffer and to die. And it is what brings joy and happiness and thankfulness to our hearts. It is because he accomplished the work to your full satisfaction. You could raise him from the dead and he's now city, sitting at thy right hand. We can give thanks and come in our time together again as we open your word. May it be a blessing for each one that we may learn something and receive a blessing from above. We give thanks and come to you in his name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so as we studied the word in EBC, uh, we had the murmuring of the people of Israel. And one verse especially struck me in the in chapter 15 of Exodus, I'll just read one verse, chapter 15, verse 25. After they had murmured, the people came to the waters of Marah, and they were bitter. But in verse 25, we see Moses cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which he, when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. We have in that verse the cross. We have that tree, that wood that God, in his grace, instructed Moses about. It was, he showed him a tree. In French, it is instructed him as to what this tree was. And this tree made the water sweet the waters where they could drink and that tree was the lord jesus who died on the cross and who made for us an abundance of grace an abundance of blessing flowing from the cross and uh, the first verse i would like to read is in jeremiah in relation to that Three, Jeremiah 11. Jeremiah chapter 11. We can see right through the scriptures, the scriptures, the thread of that tree. Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah 11, verse 19. But I was like a lamb or an ox that is brought to the slaughter, and I knew not that they had devised devices against me, saying, Let us destroy the tree with the fruit thereof, and let us cut him off from the land of the living that his name may be no more remembered. So we have here the prophecy of Jeremiah, speaking of the coming of the Lord Jesus, coming to his own, coming to his own people, and we see what will happen to him. He will be cut off. He will be in, taken in half of his days, his life will be cut short, as still in young years of life, he was to die upon the cross. Cut, off, cut him off from the land of the living. That was the, the intention of man when he came into this world. This was the manifestation of our heart. We didn't want him to reign over us. And here, the prophecy says that he will be cut off the living, that his name may be no more remembered. But we were, in his grace, this morning able to remember him, to remember his suffering, to remember his death. 
He has overcome death, and because we know of his victory, we can remember him, we can think of him, think of his grace in coming into this world, living among, living among men, and dying for his people, for dying for his creature, the one who were rejecting him. And I'd like to read the fulfillment of that prophecy in the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 23. <clears throat> Luke 23 and verse 27. <clears throat> where we see the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. Luke 23, 27, And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children, for behold, the days are coming, in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren, and the womb that never bear, and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall it be done in the dry? And they were also two other malefactors, led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them deride him, saying, he save others, let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letter Greek and Latin and Hebrew, This is the king of the Jews. And verse 26 and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hand I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. There we have the fulfillment of the prophecy of Jeremiah, where the Lord Jesus is cut off. That tree that came and to bring blessing to man, the blessed Lord Jesus who came to manifest the heart of the Father, the love of God, the one who could say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. There he was, taken by the hands of wicked men. And we can realize that if it wasn't by grace, if it wasn't by the saving grace of the Lord Jesus, we would have been among those people, those who rejected him, those who would say, we don't want him to reign over us. But the Lord Jesus came and touched our hearts, touched the hearts of those he came to save, to be able to realize that his coming into this world was for the salvation of sinners. And if we have realized before him that we are sinners, then we can confess and come to him and find eternal salvation. And when we read those verses, and <clears throat> my thought was especially on the, on the verse where the Lord speaks of that tree, green tree. He was that green tree. He was that fresh tree that came into the world and to bring healing to the nations. But we see also in that verse that there is a terrible judgment coming upon those that in the case of people of Israel that were dry for God. They were not bearing fruit, but we see that the Lord Jesus is going to be a fruitful tree 
that will bring fruit for eternity and bring praises to God. And we read that verse in Isaiah, Isaiah 53, like we read some verses of the chapter this morning, Isaiah 53 and verse 2. We see again that tree in who is coming up. Isaiah 53 verse 2, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form, no comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire of him. There is that shoot coming out of the dry ground, that root, that tree that will bear fruit for all eternity. And this is uh, marvelous to see that even the Lord Jesus, who has been cut off from the face of this earth, will bring fruit, fruit for the glory of God. And uh, these verses, verse 10 in that chapter, also 52, 53, verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. We see the results of the work of the Lord Jesus upon the cross. We see also God's counsel in when we read that it pleased the Lord to bruise him. This is something that is infinite and for mankind to understand is not possible, but we know that it was love that brought him down to earth and brought him and that let him be nailed to the cross. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. But we see also the result of that work. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He had fulfilled the work. He had done the work. God was pleased in, in him. And so the, God could put his seal of approval on his work and be glorified by that work. In Revelation chapter 22, <clears throat> one verse about also the results of the work of the Lord Jesus. Revelation 22. When we see the eternal state, <clears throat> where we see what is coming in the future, when the Lord will have its rightful place, when he will have receive all the praise and adoration. Revelation 22, verse 2, And in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was, 12, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There again, it's the result of the work of the Lord Jesus. It's what flows from the cross, a glory for God. There was the tree of life, and that tree of life is the Lord Jesus bearing fruit, and every month there will be eternal blessings flowing from that work of Calvary. We have seen in that verse in Jeremiah 11, that this, this uh, tree that was cut off and uh, the name no more remembered, we see that this same Savior who bore upon the tree our sins have, will bring an eternal result for God, an eternal adoration, an eternal praise. And I, in relation to service, I would like to also read a few verses again in Jeremiah and in chapter 17, 
Jeremiah 17. Where again we see something of that fruit. It can be applied to our own life. Chapter 17 of Jeremiah. In verse 6, uh, in verse 7, Jeremiah 17, 7, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought neither shall cease from yielding fruit. There we have the result of someone who is trusting the Lord, trusting for his eternal security, eternal safety. There is a mean of salvation. There is a mean to have that blessed assurance, blessed hope. It is to trust in what the Lord Jesus has done upon the cross. And there we see that there is result from trusting the Lord. There is from having hope in the Lord. It we will be like a tree planted by the waters, seeking that fresh water, seeking that refreshing water, seeking in the communion with God, in the communion with the Lord Jesus, in communion, in prayer, in reading his word, in being at the meeting to hear his voice. We see that it will be a fruit, it will be a green leaf, it will be a fruit that will be seen as a fruitful tree. And even in year of drought, in time of difficulties, in time of insecurity in this world, in time of many questions, many difficult times, it will not cease to yield fruit. So that looking at the Lord Jesus, looking at his work, looking at what he is for God, we can learn for, of him and be instructed by him as he was that man, despised of man, rejected by man, cut off from the land of the living, but he is the one who will bring fruit for eternity in having his own around him. And we, following him, we can bear fruit for his glory in this world. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good to see each one of you here at MIF. I would like to entitle this little message, Holy Service for a Holy God. God is holy, but man is sinful. How can we serve a holy God in holy ways? Well, that way must be prepared by God himself. Man is described in one way, God in another. I remember about 60 years ago, more or less, Brother Sewell, a missionary from Guyana, spoke at a conference in Passaic, New Jersey. And he pointed out that when God is described, he is described from head to foot. When man is described, it's from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, opposites. Well, in Deuteronomy 28, many of us will remember that this is a chapter where God pronounces blessing for his people if they would be obedient. But in the same chapter, he pronounces a curse upon those who will be disobedient. In the 35th verse of that chapter, we read, 
The Lord will smite thee in the knees and in the legs with a sore botch that cannot be healed from the sole of the foot to the top of thy head. I think of 1 Samuel. When Absalom was described, his beauty. But in all, verse 25 was 1st, 2nd Samuel 14. But in all Israel, there was none so much to be praised as Absalom for his beauty. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. This is man most appealing to some in Israel, although he was a disobedient one, seeking to dispossess his father. And of course, the Lord took him in the tree. Well, we remember also Job. Satan desired him to, to test him. Well, God gave him permission. He taking away all his possessions, his children, his, his earthly possessions. But Satan asked to touch his body. And he allowed that, but he couldn't take his life. But in Job 2, 7, Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. In Isaiah, when he's describing the people, Isaiah has to say, verse 4 to 6, Ah, sinful nation, laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, corruptors, they have forsaken thy word. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They have gone away backward. Why should ye be stricken any more? The whole head is sick, and the heart is faint. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, neither bound up nor mollified with ointment. So man is described from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. But when we come to the Lord Jesus, we can go to the book of Revelation, chapter 1, and see him there as John saw him. John turned to see the voice of him that spake unto him. And being turned, he says, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his foot. And another expression, again in the same line, he was clothed, girt about with a golden girdle from his head and his hairs, fine, white as snow, his eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass that burned in the furnace, and his voice was as a sound of many waters. So two times in this verse, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and described from his head to his feet. <clears throat> in the Song of Solomon, we're familiar with the Shunammite. When they ask her, what is your beloved more than another beloved? What does she say? Song of Solomon, verse 5, verses 10 to 15. Oh, she says, my beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among 10,000. And she describes him here from head to foot. His head is as most fine gold. His locks are bushy and black as a raven. His eyes are as the eyes of dove by the rivers of water, washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are as a bed of spices, as sweet flowers. His lips are like lilies, dropping sweet smelling myrrh. His hands are as gold rings set with the burl. His belly is bright as ivory, overlaid with sapphires. His legs are pillars of marble set upon sockets of fine gold. And then she pauses, she says, his countenance is as Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet, yea, he is altogether lovely. After describing him from head to foot, oh, she says, his whole countenance is so lovely to me. Oh, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved. This is my friend. 
He is our beloved. He is our friend. Altogether lovely. We were at EBC this previous week, and uh, we were reminded that when the Lord Jesus rose from the dead and the tomb was opened, the stone was taken away, not just rolled away, and, but also taken away. And Mary, she comes and she sees two angels sitting where? One at the head and one at the foot. The head and the foot. So our blessed Lord is described from head to foot. And all together lovely. Now there are a couple of exceptions. A couple of exceptions. You may recall the leper in Leviticus 13. The leper verse 12 and 13 of that chapter. And if leprosy break out and is brought in his skin, and the leprosy cover all the skin of him that hath the plague from his head even to his foot, wheresoever the priest looks, the priest shall consider. And behold, if the leprosy have covered all his flesh, he shall pronounce him clean that hath the plague. It is all turned white. He is clean. How can that be? A leper covered from the crown of his head to the sole of his foot. Not the other way. Pronounced clean. Well, I think of the one whom John the Baptist could say. As he contemplated, he could say, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. That leper pronounced clean. We, too, as lepers, sinners, through the blood of the Lord Jesus, we've been cleansed. We're clean. And as a cleansed leper, now that same direction flows from the head to the foot. How beautiful that is. In Psalm 133, which we so often love to quote, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. We love that verse. And we like the last verse. For there the Lord commanded the blessing. But there's something in between. It is like, let's look at that Psalm, Psalm 133. It is like two things. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments. We'll just look at that expression. There's one about to do, but we'll only look at the one of the precious ointment. That precious ointment, what was that composed of? Five ingredients. The first was the myrrh. Where does myrrh come from? It comes from a plant that has been cut or bruised, and from that cut or that bruise, something comes out. The myrrh comes out, like teardrops. From the pain that that plant has suffered, and it's those teardrops that are collected one by one to make the myrrh the suffering of that plant. The second, and well, the cinnamon and cassia were two items taken from a tree or a bush. Where was it from? The bark. Not the outside so much, but the inner part of the bark that runs right next to the heart of the tree from which all the nourishment flows up through the, through the plant. It's taken from that bark. It's dried, it's pulverized, made very fine, but it leaves a scar, a permanent scar on the tree from which it was taken. The sufferings of that tree produces the cinnamon and the cassia. The calamus was taken from a plant 
The root, it grew in the swampy area. In the swampy area, in the marsh, the Lord Jesus, you know, he could say, I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. The water floods have overflown me. But the cassia grows in that kind of environment. But it's taken and from that root, that plant, another fragrance is provided. The oil in which is the carrier for all of those ingredients, these spaces are blended together. They're not mixed together. They are blended together by the skill of the apothecary, a very unique process, skillful, careful, detailed process by the apothecary to blend them into one precious ointment, unique and precious and holy. And all the items of the tabernacle were, were uh, under the influence of this wonderful ointment to sanctify them, set them apart for God. And in Psalm 133, we have the path. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, and went down to the skirts of his garments. What was that path? Can you picture in your mind the high priest standing there in his God-appointed robes and garments? And this oil was poured upon him. What was the first thing that that oil touched? There was the crown. What did it say? It was a golden crown. Holiness to the Lord. That was the first place. Next, the lace of blue on the white turban. Heavenly for the blue, pure white turban. Heavenly thoughts. Things from God's mind. You know, poured down, but that oil poured from the crown to the blue, to the white, and then over his beard. That which comes from inside of man, that which comes out from us here, that had to be also sanctified by that holy oil. Then it went down on the onyx stones on the shoulders of the high priest. There they were, born in dignity and honor and strength before God, the names of the twelve tribes inscribed upon them. And then down over the breastplate, there were the golden chains, the precious stones with the names of the tribes again on them, and the pouch for the Urim and the Thummim. All of these, the vital organs, adorned and supported by these precious things, displaying the lights and perfections of God. And that oil flowed down to the skirts of his garments, to the bells and the pomegranates there. And as he walked, the wonderful music and harmony for God, the fruitfulness spoken of by the pomegranates, fruit for God, but anointed with this precious ointment that came from suffering, God appreciates suffering for him. It's how wonderful to him such suffering is. Now, the anointing of the priest in the Old Testament was an outward thing. It covered the outside of the priest. But for us, what happened at Pentecost? When the Holy Spirit came there in that upper room, where the disciples and many others were gathered together. And it came, and as they were sitting with one accord in one place, suddenly there came the sound from heaven as a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like a fire that sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. It was not just something for the outside now. It was something that filled them inwardly. The Holy Spirit has come to take his abode in our hearts. More wonderful than the priest's anointing, as beautiful and wonderful as that was, but we, anointed by the Holy Spirit, 
who lives, lives within us. And we, this is what we need for preparation for our service, to recognize that where we are. When the apostle wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians, he writes unto them, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified and set apart to Christ, through Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, saints by divine calling with all them in every place that call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, our Lord, both theirs and ours. We are saints, holy ones, by calling. God has called us and God has prepared us with his Holy Spirit indwelling us. And even though there were many problems in Corinth, God said they were addressed by Paul as holy ones. Before he begins to address those problems, and if we're going to be effective with each other in our service to the Lord, we just need to be in the good of what God has provided for us. Such wonderful blessings and such a place of honor and dignity that we have before him. God is so wonderful. We think of Mary and Martha, you know, in John 12, where they made him a supper. Something for him, especially for him. We find Lazarus sitting at the table with him. Martha was serving in her place. Mary was sitting at his feet, each together in his presence, serving him. And so we do. We are equipped for service. We are equipped to serve our Lord. Our sins are gone. We've been brought into relationship with him. He is our Lord and Savior. But at the same time, he has also provided all the resources we need. The word of God, the Holy Spirit, a desire from within to please and serve him. All our resources come from him. They flow down from him. We bring our service back to him. Where do we meet? At his feet. Where will we be for all eternity? By his side. What a wonderful place. What a wonderful one to serve. And the provisions that we have are unlimited and fully available. May God help us as we seek to serve him. If you need a copy of this outline, it will be on the back table for you later. Thank you. Lord bless each one as we serve him.